Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for this Nestle Health Science webinar, which is an overview of parenteral and intral nutrition group or PENG guidelines. And we're going to be looking at applications both in hospital and in the community settings. So the agenda for this webinar, my name is Rebecca Starr. I am dietitian at North of Scotland Major Trauma Centre based in Aberdeen. And this evening I am going to be presenting on the newest PENG nutritional requirements and practical applications for implementing these into departments and practice. Next up, we will have Caitlin Gilfillan and Kirsty Knight, colleagues from Ninewells Hospital in Dundee, who will be presenting a case study of a critical care patient with pancreatitis. And finally this evening, we will have Rebecca Gash, who is lead dietitian in gastroenterology and surgery down in Cheshire West Integrated Care Partnership. And she is going to share with us a case study of an enteral feeding patient in the community with complex tolerance issues. So like I say, I'm dietitian at North of Scotland Major Trauma Centre. And what I would like to share with you today is the presentation that we use locally in our department to implement the newest PENG guidelines. And I then went on to deliver this presentation to various departments around the UK um, and departments really found it helpful in implementing it into their practice. My contact details are here, should you require them. So just as a kind of a starter, some comments that my colleagues had made when the new PENG guidelines came out were that it was almost a little bit like some of the dietetics that had been done earlier on in their careers. On the left-hand side of the screen there, you can see one of the very first PENG pocket guides to clinical nutrition. And this edition actually didn't have a nutritional requirements section. What they did kind of back then was they would take a diet history from a patient and they would either add additional calories or take away calories depending on what the patient's goal was and alter protein, making suggestions. And there was no set nutritional requirements. It wasn't a calculation that they did as part of their practice. And then, of course, as time came on and evidence came out, we became quite focused on nutritional requirements. And we would calculate them as standard uh, for most of our patients. And now with the new nutritional requirements, with the new PENG guidelines, we're going back to being a bit more big with our nutritional requirements. We're giving more of a range. And we're using clinical judgment a lot more, which is more similar to what my colleagues had reflected on from years previously when they had practiced dietetics. So in 2018, PENGE did a large literature review looking at ways to calculate nutritional requirements, updated ways to, to do these calculations. And they were looking for evidence that took into account disease state. Instead of Henry, which was kind of invalidated in healthy individuals, we were looking at something that we'd, we could use in those with disease states. And it does require much greater use of clinical judgment and reasoning than perhaps we're used to previously. The equations are determined by age category and BMI, as well as underlying disease states. And they are done in calories per kilogram for energy and grams per kilogram for protein. So let's look at energy requirements first off. So old versus new, what we would have previously done in times gone by, we would have calculated a BMR, we would have added on a stress factor and an activity factor to give us our total estimated energy requirement. Now what we've got is some slightly new terminology. We have resting energy expenditure plus an activity factor to give us our total estimated energy requirement. Now the resting energy expenditures are almost a combination of your BMR and your stress factor together. 
because your resting energy expenditure will take into account your patient's disease state, which is when we would have been thinking about stress factors previously. Just a bit of caution, if you do have your Penge books in front of you or you're looking up the Penge tables online, there are REE, resting energy expenditure tables, that are available both for actual body weight and for fat-free mass. And it may be that the fat-free mass is not relevant to you in your practice. I've certainly found that I very rarely have that information available on our patients. As some of our renal dietitians that have a really good bioimpedance are able to use that, but it may be that it's not relevant for your patient group. And it's very easy to confuse the two tables. They're right next to each other in the book. And it's easy to just open the page and find you on the fat free mass. And the data in the two tables is different. So just a word of warning, be careful not to confuse them if the fat free mass is not relevant to your patient group. So we have a three step process for calculating the new nutritional requirements. We first of all have the basic data we would have on all our patients, uh, true or estimated dry weight, a BMI and an age. We then look for our REE value, our resting energy expenditure value, and we then add a PAL. And that can be summarised in this table here. And we will go through this table section by section and break it down. So starting with the middle section of that table there. So we have combined BMI groups here for healthy BMI and overweight BMI. So the BMI category is 18.5 to 30. If we then look at the resting energy expenditures for these groups in, the, in this BMI category in the table, there are some condition specific listed REE values, but you will see throughout your tables that there are blank spaces. And that is because there's not been enough data, enough evidence to give an REE value in this category. And therefore, you've got a default value that you can always fall back on in this BMI group. And for this group, that is 20 to 25 calories per kilo. So if there's no data available for your specific patient's disease state, 20 to 25 calories would be what you would use. And again, you'd add a PAL there, as we always have done for activity. In the underweight patients in BMI less than 18.5, again, there are some condition specific REE values given. However, there are a few more gaps in this group and your default value for this group is 25 to 30 calories per kilo, which is of course, once you have accounted for any refeeding risk and gradual increase up to estimated requirements. So you can always use 25 to 30 calories per kilo in this group if there's not a condition specific REE listed. And again, in this group, we add a PAL for activity. For our patients that um, have a BMI over 30, our base patients, this is probably where there's the biggest change to our practice. Um, what we then use to calculate REE is the Mifflin's and Schur equation. And again, there are one or two specific um, condition specific values given in the tables. However, it is only one or two. The majority of your patients, you will be using the Mifflin Centure or MSG equation. And where we previously would have omitted an activity factor in our obese patients, we omit the PAL unless it's felt to be appropriate given based on clinical reasoning, given their recovery and where they are in that. So the Mifflin's and Jure equations you can see here, there's slightly different variations for male and female. The nutrition company apps can help. Uh, they do have sections then for calculating patients' nutritional requirements, and it does have Mifflin's and Jure as an option. For those of you who are rural and can't rely on internet, they don't need to be connected to the internet for the apps to do the calculations for you. So it can be really handy to have that if it's available to you. If you are doing Mifflin St. by hand, the only thing to remember is bod mass. So the order in which you do your brackets of division, multiple, multiplication, addition and subtraction. If you don't do the equation in quite the right order, 
you will get the wrong answer and it will be quite obvious that it's not been done correctly because you kind of get calories that are in the millions. So it will be very obvious that you've done the calculation wrong if you don't follow the correct order. So the new PALs, the values themselves here haven't really changed much. I'm sure you'll kind of recognise them from what we've been doing for years. The biggest change is really the description and the examples that are given. But the values you use for your PAL will be similar to what you've always done based on the history you've gathered from your patient. So again, this is just a summary of this table here, depending on BMI group and what your default option is for calculating requirements, should there not be a value given in the table for your PENG book. Some of the provided REE values that are there, there's a huge range of um, oncology conditions listed. And then there's more general options like various cancers, losing weight, various cancers, more metabolically stable. Dementia is listed there, ALS and MND is there, COPD. And then there's more general ones like mixed populations, inpatients and outpatients. And the good thing is that at the end of the table, at the end of the row, they cite the evidence that was used to come up with that REE and where they source that information from. So if you're not sure if that REE is appropriate for your patient group and who you're treating, you can go and have a look at the evidence and again, clinical reasoning and clinical judgment, decide if that is appropriate for you to use. So I've just got an example here just to go through um, a male, 73 years old, with ischemic stroke, 78 kilograms, 1.8 meters with a BMI of 24. And he is currently up to sit in his chair at this point in his journey. So his BMI sits within that mid range there. And for somebody of his age, there is a condition specific REE listed in the table for ischemic stroke. And we add a PAL. So it's 21 calories per kilo is the REE, which gives us 1638. And then a PAL of 1.2, because he's up to sit in his chair, which gives us um, a total energy estimation of 1966 calories. Now, if we have the same patient with the same anthropometry and the same clinical condition, but he's only 40 years old, then this changes our requirements slightly. So he's still in the same BMI category, but because he is under 65, there is no data for REE in the table which supports his clinical condition and his anthropometry. So we have to use our default value of 20 to 25 calories per kilo, and then we add a PAL as we did before. So in this case, we've got our range there. So our REE comes out at a range of 1560 to 1950. We add the same PAL, our 1.2, which gives us a total energy estimation of 1872-2340. And this is where clinical judgment comes in. That's quite a vast range. Um, and it's clinical judgment as to where in that range you would start feeding your patient. And again, it's a reminder that this is just a starting point and you can alter within that range depending on what happens to your patient clinically. And it may be that every dietitian would pick somewhere different within that range, as long as we are documenting our clinical judgment and why we've done what we've done. That's the most important thing. Use your clinical judgment always. The second example I have here is a patient of mine who's a female, 73 years old. She had a spinal cord injury and she was 75 kilos, 1.5 meters, which gave her a BMI of 33.3 and she was being hoisted from her chair to the bed and back. So because she is in the obese category, we're going to use Mifflin Sendure to calculate her requirements and we omit the PAL unless felt appropriate. So her Mifflin here is done by hand and that gave us an REE of 1162 calories. And normally we would omit the PAL in this patient. However, I was standing at the end of this patient's bed, having a look at her clinically, 
I didn't feel that was enough to meet her nutritional requirements. Her chest wasn't great. She was quite unwell generally. And I just didn't feel that 1162 was really enough to maintain her. So in this case, I did add a PAL, a small PAL of 1.1 to 1.2, which gave me, as the range you can see there, 1355 to 1478. And I felt more comfortable starting within that range, at the lower end of that range, and then monitoring from there. Again, it's clinical judgment and documenting why I did that and what my thought process was. Moving on to protein requirements. These are done in a similar way here, but a similar table where we can um, divide them up by BMI group. However, your default for protein is always 1 to 1.5 grams per kilogram, regardless of the BMI group. So if we start on the left hand side at those with the lower BMI, less than 18.5, range is 1 to 1.5, but the suggestion is that you start at the upper end of that range, that 1.5 grams per kilogram, again, once you have accounted for any refeeding risk and gradual introduction of nutrition. For those in the mid-group there, the 18.5 to 30 BMIs, there are some condition-specific protein requirements listed. There are far few for protein than there are for energy, but there are some there. And if your patient doesn't fit into any of those listed, you can use your 1 to 1.5. For your patients with a BMI over 30, again, you can use the condition specific or your default 1 to 1.5. But whichever you choose, we're still doing 75% of that for patients who are BMI 30 to 50 and 65% for those who are over BMI 50. So the same process we did previously, regardless of whether you choose condition specific or your default option. Some of the condition specific protein requirements that are listed that I commonly see, commonly use, there's pressure ulcers, which is 1.25 to 1.5. That is both for patients who are at risk of pressure ulcers and those who have already developed pressure ulcers. There are older adults, those over 65, 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilo. Adults receiving radiation therapy, a minimum of 1.2 grams per kilogram. And for burns, we've got 1.5 to 2 grams per kilogram there. For renal and liver patients, there are a lot more detailed protein requirements in the renal and liver sections at the back of the PENG book in those individualized sections for those condition-specific patients. So if we go back to my patient, my 72 year old lady with spinal cord injury, we know her anthropometry, we know she's in that obese category. So for her protein requirements, we could do no condition specific and there is no spinal cord injury specific protein requirements, which would be the one to 1.5 we would use then. You could also argue this lady is quite high risk of pressure ulcers and you could do the 1.25 to 1.5, which gives you the range there. Regardless of which of these you were to choose, we would do a 75% of the estimate because her BMI was 33. So we either have 56 or 85 if we're going on our default option or 70 to 85 grams if we were to use that risk of pressure ulcers value. This is some local paperwork that I wanted to share. We in Aberdeen are still on paper record cards. And so we found this paperwork really helpful. What we did was we gathered in groups of specialties, so renal, gastro, surgical, et cetera. And we filled out a paper bit of paperwork like this for the front of our folders. So that cross covering from other groups and other departments was made much easier. Before, where we would have all been using Henry, if we'd gone to help out in another specialty, we knew Henry and we knew what we were doing with it. But because of the new REEs being different for each patient group, we will perhaps fall out of touch a bit more with what other specialties are using to calculate their nutritional requirements. So we found this really helpful for each specialty to create um, this table, the lower table here, and fill in with the commonly used REE values that they see 
that they're using for their patients. And it's actually really good for students as well, coming into different specialties, get an idea of what REE values are used there that they might be less familiar with. And we did put at the top there the default values for every group as a reminder there. So you can see here, this is our oncology team's um, paperwork that they have um, at the front of their folder. And so if I was to go and cover oncology for a day, I can see there the REEs that they are using in their patient groups. So to summarize, you will come to learn the REEs that you most commonly use, and you will know them off the back of your hand eventually. Um, as you begin to use them more and you are familiar with the ones that are appropriate to your patient group. Remember that estimated requirements are a starting point only and you've got wiggle room either within the range or to go up and down from the value that is your starting point. Use your clinical judgment and your clinical reasoning and I think the most important thing is we document our decision when we're doing using our clinical judgment and picking requirements and what we're going to feed to so that dietitians that come before us can see exactly our thinking and why we've chosen what we have. And just a, a final quote here, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think that is really important when implementing this into a team or into a department. Everybody has to do it together at the same time, and everybody has to be in agreement within the smaller teams and specialities as to what you agree on, what the evidence base is for your patients and how you're going to implement in this department. And it does take a while to adapt to and get used to it, but everybody doing it together is the best way forward to move through. Thank you. So next we have Caitlin Gilfillan and Kirsty Knight, who are colleagues at Nine Wells Hospital in Dundee. Caitlin is a specialist dietitian in surgery and Kirsty is the acute team lead dietitian for major trauma. And like I say today, they are going to be sharing case study from a critical care patient with pancreatitis. Thanks, Rebecca, for, for that. Um, so myself and Caitlin will be presenting our case study presentation on a critical care patient here at Nine Wells Hospital. So just a quick overview of the presentation. So um, it's a summary of a critical care patient here at Nine Wells Hospital. Um, the case study covers the dietetic assess assessment, nutritional diagnosis and intervention using the old PENS requirements. Um, we then go on to compare the updated PENS requirements and potential implications for diet dietetic intervention and the implementation of updated PENS requirements in the practice and NHS T side. Um, so just to kind of give you an overview of how critical care looks in Nine Wells Hospital. So before COVID-19, we had nine intensive care beds here and 10 surgical high dependency beds. So this isn't including any of our medical high dependency or neuro high dependency beds. Um, but now kind of on the other side of COVID, hopefully we're, we're coming out of COVID now. Um, we still have our nine intensive care beds. We've got four surgical high dependency beds, which are for any un unscheduled care. We've got four green pathway surgical high dependency beds, which is for the planned um, elective surgeries that we have here. And we've got five high dependency beds for any aerosol generating procedures. So for medical and surgical patients. Um, that's also not including any of our COVID um, intensive care or COVID um, medical or surgical high dependency beds. So just to give a bit of a background and past medical history of the patient. So it's a 51 year old male who was unemployed. He presented to um, the hospital. So it was a readmiss readmission to hospital with acute on chronic episode of pancreatitis with poor nutritional intake and significant weight loss. He developed type one respiratory failure and required ICU admission. The patient had a past medical history of chronic pancreatitis, type two diabetes, 
Eva is insulin dependent, esophagitis, gastritis, depression, drug overdose, alcohol excess and seizures. So quite an extensive past medical history. So on initial assessment, um, looking at the patient's anthropometry, he had a weight of 48.6 kilograms, height of 1.78, giving the patient a BMI of 15.4 kilograms per meter squared. Biochemistry wise, um, using these were normal, ALP was raised, um, magnesium raised, phosphate was 0.3, so um, considerably low. I raised CRP and amylase of 414, um, which was raised. So this is kind of a typical picture of a pancreatitis pa patient, um, electrolytes being deranged and also considered in refeeding risk with his um, electrolytes being off. Um, clinically, um, the patient had severe abdominal pain with associated vomiting. The CT showed ongoing abnormal head of pancreas and up upper abdominal lymphadenopathy. Um, the patient was transferred to surgical high dependency with respiratory failure and was on 60 litres of oxygen, but symptoms began to worsen, so he was then transferred to intensive care for respiratory support. Um, the patient was very agitated and therefore was sedated and ventilated. So looking at the dietary section, the patient had a two-week history of poor dietary intake prior to admission. He was allowed only clear fluids for four days, so was commenced on diazepam and Pabrinex um, protocol due to his history of alcohol excess and was treated as a refeeding risk due to his low BMI, weight loss and two-week history of minimal nutritional intake. When estimating requirements with the old PENS requirements, we used the Henry equation um, and calculated BMR to be... Um, using this equation, 1,283 calories. We added a um, 10 to 20% stress factor due to the pancreatitis um, and a 0% stress factor because the patient was in intensive care, sedated and ventilated, so we didn't add an activity factor, given total calories of 1,411 to 1,539 calories per day. And um, nitrogen and protein, we went for 0 0.17 to 0 0.2 grams of nitrogen per kilogram, which gave 8.2 to 9.7 grams of nitrogen per day. And converting that into protein is 51 to 61 grams per day. So our nutritional diagnosis was inadequate nutritional intake due to the effects of acute on chronic pancreatitis with associated vomiting as evidenced by nutrition, reduced dietary intake, weight loss and low BMI. And I'll now hand over to Caitlin who will go through the dietetic interventions while in intensive care. Thanks Kirsty. So I'll just move on to the dietetic intervention. So as we mentioned on the previous slides, um, for the first four days he was on clear fluids only. Um, with a two-week history of minimal, minimal intake prior to admission, so we considered him to be at high risk of pre-feeding syndrome. By day five, the um, ICU consultant had decided to commence TPN uh, via central line that the patient already had in place. We started at 10 calories per kilo per day initially because of his high refeeding risk, which came out at 486 calories. Um, so we use one of our peripheral bags. Um, so although it says peripheral TPN, it, it was run through a central line, but we used a peripheral bag because it was the lowest calories um, at 25 mils an hour, which gave him 455 calories and 2.7 grams of nitrogen. Over the next few days, days six to nine, his TPN regime was built up to a goal rate of 52 mils an hour of a, a central bag, which provided um, 1464 calories and 9.9 .9 grams of nitrogen, which met his full estimated nutritional requirements. He was on minimal propofol at this point, three mils an hour. Um, in Tayside, we tend to only count the propofol if it's a significant amount, for example, above 10 mils an hour. Um, so we didn't count it in these circumstances. Um, by day 10, the patient had been extubated and the consultant wanted to start a trial of NG feeding just at 10 mils an hour for 12 hours and then increase it to 25 mils an hour for the next 12 hours to monitor tolerance. Um, we switched his TPM bag over to a more omega-based, omega-fat-based um, 
bag for liver protection and um, just because of the period of time he'd been on um, the TPN plus his extensive past medical history including alcohol excess um, we remained we kept him at the full rate of 52 mils an hour until we could establish enteral feed however he, he then had high NG aspirates in ICU so we were using metoclopramide as a prokinetic so we recommended a trial of erythromycin to see if this would also help with his aspirates he also was then having multiple episodes of loose stools during the day, so five episodes of type 7. They obviously sent a sample to the lab to check for an infectious cause. Um, but by day 12, the results were back and there was no infectious cause found. Um, and the aspirates were still remaining high. So we then switched to a peptide-based feed um, due to his clinical presentation of pancreatitis and the suggestion that um, he had signs of malabsorption. So this peptide-based feed had 70% um, MCT um, and peptide-based. By day 14, the enteral feed um, was stopped again with the NG back on free drainage because his aspirates remained high. The surgical team then came to review and we proceeded to nasogeginal feeding. We, again, we kept TPN going to maintain this nutritional whilst we were awaiting um, establishment of enteral nutrition. By day 15, um, the NG was in and we started at 10 mils an hour of a peptide feed. This was tolerated much better um, from the beginning. We then planned to increase the NG feed to the goal rate of 63 mils an hour for 24 hours and gradually wean down the TPN. So to do this, we, we tend to do increasing the, the NJ rate by 10 mils and reducing the TPN by 10 mils until we get to the goal rate so that we're not leaving any gaps in um, any nutritional deficits. By day 17, the patient was stepped back down to surgical high dependency and his TPN was discontinued because his NJ feed was at um, its goal rate and volume. At this point, we switched to overnight feeding to give the patient more freedom to work with physio and things during the day. So we had him at 126 mils an hour for 12 hours of peptide feed. By day 20, um, he improved again. So he was stepped down to the main surgical ward. Um, he was allowed some soup and jelly orally and we tried him with um, an oral nutritional supplement once a day. We then recalculated his requirements as he was now able to mobilize. We needed to add an activity factor. So we kept the, the we used the same BMR with the Henry equation. We added on a 20% activity factor and our 10 to 15% stress factor, which gave us 1732 calories. Um, the protein was again 0 0.17 to 0 0.25 grams per kilo of nitrogen, which came to 51 to 76 grams a day of protein. Our plan at this point was to have the feed at 126 mils an hour for 12 hours see how we got on with the soup and jelly and the oral nutritional supplement once a day. At day 24, the patient had recovered enough to be discharged home. He was trained to use the NJ tube and, and feeding pump at home. We had reduced him to 800 mils of feed at this point um, because his oral intake had increased and he was tolerating ONS twice a day. So we had him at eight mils an hour for 10 hours overnight um, with his feed. He was then handed over to the home mental nutrition dietitian for ongoing follow-up. If we had used the new PENS requirements that Rebecca has just kindly gone through with us, um, our, we were going to use the 26 calories per kilo um, for acute pancreatitis, which gave us 1263 calories, um, a pile of 1.2 to 1.25 whilst he was on the ward, which gave us 1516 to 1580. The protein is the biggest difference we noticed here. So if we were to use um, 1.5 grams per kilo per day based on an ideal body weight of 63.4, just as he's a surgical patient at risk, this gave us uh, a total of 95 grams a day um, and the equivalent nitrogen is 15.2. So the, I'll just go into this, we've created a table to compare them. So as you can see, the old, using old um, equations, the calories, the calories are quite similar to the new, new equation calories, but the protein is the biggest difference. So but initially it was 51 to 61 grams of protein um, and we used 1500 mils of a standard one calorie per mil um, peptide feed. 
However, if we'd used the new PENS requirements and his protein requirement was 95 grams, um, we went, then would have needed to use a peptide feed with additional nitrogen um, to make up the deficit to actually meet his protein requirement. Um, in terms of rolling out the new PENS requirements in NHS Tayside, um, Rebecca Starr kindly facilitated a session for us on the, the 10th of September 2020. Um, at this point, um, similar to what Rebecca's um, colleagues have developed, um, we made a kind of ready reckoner so that we would again have um, a, a list of the relevant equations at the front of our folders, um, just in case of cross covering, etc. And it meant that we were not having to go through all the sections of the PENG guide on the wards. Um, it's now in use service wide across NHS Tayside and um, it seems to be going well and we've not had, I'm not aware of any, um, we're not tending to use any of the old equations anymore. So to conclude, um, based on the new um, PENG guidelines, our feed plan would have been quite different due to the considerable difference in the patient's protein requirements. Um, the higher protein requirements would have indicated the use of a higher nitrogen peptide feed or a 1.5 cal per mil peptide feed rather than a standard feed. And using a peptide feed containing 70% MCT was better tolerated for this patient than a whole protein feed was. And it eliminated the need for use of Creon with his enteral feed as well. Because he was, with his significant past medical history, he did have a lot of medications as well. So if we were able to not use Creon with his enteral feed, then that was a positive thing as well. I'll now hand you over to Rebecca Gash, who's going to give you her presentation um, on enteral feeding in the community. Thank you, Caitlin and Kirsty. There's certainly food for, for thought there with the comparison between the old requirements and the newer version. Um, if anybody has any questions relating to that, it can be submitted through the question box on your screens there, and we'll address those in the Q&A at the end. Our final presentation today comes from Rebecca Gash. She is the lead gastroenterology and surgery dietitian at Cheshire West Integrated Care Partnership. And Rebecca is today going to be presenting an enteral feeding in the community case study of a patient with complex uh, tolerance. Thank you. Uh, so just to expand really on a bit of an introduction um, for myself and the services that we run here um, in Chester. So my role as the clinical lead for gastroenterology and surgical services involves kind of overseeing the gastrosurgical and critical care wards, as well as managing the community gastro uh, clinics and services. I'm also a non-medical prescriber, so do some work uh, within the Chester South primary care network. So I'm also in the GP practices and some freelance writing as well. In terms of our home enteral tube feeding uh, service at Chester, so myself being the specialist in gastroenterology, I actually have a small number of enterally fed patients on my caseload in the community. So the wider home enteral tube feeding team um, involves some more specialist dietitians and nutrition nurses who take care of um, other patients being fed in the community um, due to certain cancers or neurological um, conditions. So what I'm going to talk about today is a case study. So it is quite a complex case study for one of my patients in the community. Um, so there is quite a lot uh, to cover today. Um, so I'm just going to talk through how we progressed um, going from um, oral diet into permanent enteral feeding for this patient and also managing some quite difficult tolerance issues. And I'm also going to talk about the PEND requirements um, that were used for this patient. So a bit of a background on uh, this patient. So she's a female in her 30s, early 30s. So she's very independent um, working. And the main kind of issues that we've had with her is a very long standing low BMI. So I'll talk about that a bit more as the presentation goes on. And her two main conditions in her past medical history were or are small bowel Crohn's disease. So this was diagnosed in 2009. And then more recently, a diagnosis of gastroparesis. Uh, 
So before I delve deeper um, into my case study, I just wanted to touch a bit on gastroparesis. So gastroparesis, you may have um, heard of it as delayed stomach emptying. Um, so basically the stomach contents moves through slower, which can lead to symptoms such as early satiety, nausea and vomiting, loss of appetite, weight loss and abdominal pain. Now, the most common causes for gastroparesis are usually poorly controlled diabetes or following certain surgeries, or sometimes they are idiopathic. Um, other times it can be as a result of medications or certain conditions. So when looking at gastroparesis and Crohn's disease together, so Crohn's disease, as we know, is a type of inflammatory bowel disease um, thought to affect approximately one in every 650 people in the UK. Gastroparesis is a little bit less common, so um, approximately 14 in every 100,000 um, people in the UK. Now, it's thought that gastroparesis and Crohn's disease uh, together is thought to be quite rare, um, but their querying of the links are due to motility disturbances due to the inflammation or potential obstructions in IBD, but they're not too sure. So coming back to the case study, so just looking at some of the complexities that we found um, with this patient's diagnosis. So as I mentioned, the small bowel Crohn's disease was diagnosed back in 2009. Um, but achieving this diagnosis was quite difficult. Um, it was difficult to assess and still is difficult to assess when this patient is in a flare up of their Crohn's disease. So interestingly, uh, inflammatory markers, so CRP and ESR are always normal, even if she's in a Crohn's flare up. Her fecal calprotectin, which is the stool um, sample, which can be a marker of inflammation in IBD, um, is usually not that raised. So usually 100, 200, um, whereas commonly in a flare up of Crohn's disease, this can be in the thousands. To assess flare ups, um, she needs capsule endoscopies, which um, often fail more recently. This is thought to be due to the gastroparesis and um, she suffers from quite severe symptoms, um, so particularly of abdominal pain and nausea, some loose bowel movements as well, um, but yeah, very um, much impacting on her quality of life. So that nausea started to progress further into vomiting um, in 2009 and then definitely through to 2020. This increase in vomiting uh, led to this patient having gastric emptying studies, uh, which uh, gave the diagnosis of gastroparesis. And it was quite severe gastric emptying with 75% retention after five minutes. Now, unfortunately, following this, the vomiting frequency increased from three times a week um, to about three to five times a day. Um, she's under close care of the gastroenterology team here, but unfortunately, um, it was really difficult to manage her nausea uh, with a uh, you know, variety of antiemetics. So looking at this patient's weight history, so I've mentioned that she's had long standing issues with a very low BMI. Um, so she tells me that her highest weight as an adult um, was 44 kilos. Now this puts her BMI at 15.2 and um, her lowest weight actually dropped to about 37.5 kilos, putting her BMI at just 13. Now, because of the complexities of this um, patient, we've had a number of MDTs um, to discuss her symptoms and her management over the years. At one point when her weight was coming down, but the consultants couldn't quite confirm evidence of IBD flare up. Uh, there was a query if she had an eating disorder. However, we don't think um, this is the case, but it has it has been raised um, in the past. But we do think her low BMI is purely just as a result of her disease state. And just to kind of plot that um, on a graph here. Now I, I've put the um, bottom axis down to 2011, just to really show uh, how long um, this has been impacting on this patient's weight. So 39 kilos back in 2011. As you can see in around 2017, she did manage to increase her weight. However, it gradually trailed off and then quite quickly dropped um, as after the diagnosis of gastroparesis. <clears throat> 
And when you look at this patient's diet history, it's no wonder that um, her BMI has been low for such a long time. So I took over her care in 2016. Um, and at this point, she was really only able to tolerate a very limited diet. So she was unable to tolerate any whole protein or nutritional supplements. The only one she could tolerate was a, a mix of um, two elemental amino acid based supplements and one peptide based 1.5 cal per mil supplement. And on top of that, she was able to manage one low residue and low fat meal per day. She was taking a multivitamin in addition to this, but as you can see, the estimated intake of her diet was um, really very low in terms of calories. Unfortunately, none of the standard uh, food first advice that dietitians would provide um, she found difficult to tolerate because she has quite a low tolerance levels to fat as well. As the gastroparesis diagnosis was confirmed and this condition sadly worsened, then her diet was limited to a liquid only diet. So at this point, she was aiming for five uh, mix of those oral nutritional supplements per day. Um, however, as the disease progressed, she was unfortunately vomiting these. So it's no surprise that um, enteral feeding was um, opted for at this point. It is worth mentioning that uh, this patient has had periods of enteral feeding um, over the years, both in our trust and at other trusts where she was looked after prior to us. Um, more so in management of her Crohn's disease and Crohn's flare up. And um, I was suggesting it as her weight was gradually reducing in more recent years. However, the patient was really keen to try and manage this as best she could orally for as long as possible. So it would often decline um, a short period of enteral feeding. However, as the gastroparesis progressed, unfortunately, um, uh, it was the right next step to take. So a nasogeginal tube was placed. So we went for jejunal feeding um, due to the gastroparesis. So we wanted to bypass the stomach. So we weren't having that delayed emptying effect. Refeeding risk was um, managed um, obviously due to her very low BMI. And after a trial period of NJ feeding and finding out that um, you know, this is going to really support this patient's nutritional status, a permanent jejunal feeding tube was placed. So when looking at the estimated requirements for this patient, um, I think it's worth mentioning, and I think Rebecca Starr um, touched on this in her first presentation today, um, that I feel particularly when looking after community patients, we use clinical judgment more so than um, when seeing patients on the ward when it comes to estimating requirements. Um, so obviously we use the PENDS requirements as a guide, but I think when you're reviewing patients less frequently as they're out in the community, you really go on more of the whole clinical picture and what their weight is doing. Um, but for this particular patient, I used the PENDS Crohn's BMI of under 18.5. Um, there isn't any specific requirements for gastroparesis, so I went for um, the Crohn's um, under 18.5. I put a PAL of 1.4 to 1.5 because, as I said, she is quite independent at home, um, but, but due to her um, condition, she's not um, going to be really active, um, which you can see gave a um, estimation of between, well, around 1500 calories and the protein 37 to 56 grams per day. When comparing this to the PENJ requirements, which I did just for the sake of this webinar, um, the old Henry equation actually gave uh, the calorie requirements a little bit higher, um, interestingly, for this one, which I think is slightly different to the last presentation that we've just watched as well. In terms of the feeding regimes, so the initial regime that we tried with this patient was sticking to the um, 1.5 cal per mil peptide based nutritional supplement, which was 70-30 whey casein and 70% MCT. So this is the um, same feed equivalent that the patient was having as an oral nutritional supplement. And I was hoping as we were bypassing the stomach, it was going to be better tolerated. She needed to um, have 1000 mils of this to meet requirements. However, unfortunately, 
it was quite poorly tolerated. Um, she felt a lot of nausea um, and couldn't manage more than 700 mils of this, so therefore wouldn't meet her nutritional requirements. We then switched to another peptide based feed, um, which was 100% whey protein um, and 1.3 cows per mil. This feed was a lot better tolerated. Um, however, because it was slightly less concentrated in terms of cows per mil, the patient did need more than 1000 mils to meet her requirements. So we wanted to aim for 1200 mils. Um, however, she found that she couldn't tolerate more than a thousand mils on, on a good day of this feed. And, you know, it was quite extended periods of time. She was having to be connected to her pump. Um, so we weren't quite there with this feed, although her gastrointestinal symptoms had settled. So the third regime we tried is a, another peptide based feed, but this time 1.5 cal per mil and also 100% whey protein at 52% um, MCT. So with this feed, she just needs to get a thousand mils to meet her calorie requirements. Um, and she found that she was able to tolerate this. Um, her GI symptoms were more settled on this and she actually found that her energy levels um, had, had increased and she's generally feeling much better on this current feed. We are aware that we are overfeeding on her protein requirements. However, in terms of trialing the different feeds, uh, this really was the um, best fit for this patient. And there's no other concerning factors um, for um, you, you know, high protein diets for this patient. So where are we now? Um, so the weight is gradually increasing. So we're at about 41.5 kilos now. Um, with the current regime in place. Volume tolerance does remain a little bit of an issue. So although she's meeting her requirements with the thousand mils, ideally we would want to increase this further. So uh, the old penge recommended an additional 400 calories per day to increase, um, uh, to continue weight gain. Um, we have tried additional flushes with a purely carbohydrate based supplement or bolusing additional nutritional supplements down, um, which unfortunately haven't been that well tolerated either. So the next option is to try extending the length of time that the patient's on the feed, which again isn't ideal in terms of um, uh, how it fits in with her lifestyle. Um, so this is kind of an ongoing trial and error um, that we're managing at the moment. She does still have some ongoing symptoms in terms of her Crohn's disease. So we're having regular consultations with her gastroenterologist, the occasional vomiting, but this is much improved. Depending how things go, if we can't get our manage of her symptoms or can't quite increase the feed to continue this um, you know, positive weight gain, there may be a consider consideration of parental nutrition down the line. Okay, and that was everything from me. So I will hand back to Rebecca. Thank you, Rebecca. That was really interesting, a really interesting patient and interesting to see how the pinch requirements work in the community and how you found them using them in a community setting. So thank you. We will now move on to our live panel Q&A, which will consist of all the dietitians that you have seen presenting today and we'll address some of the questions that you've asked throughout this webinar. Thank you. Thank you everybody for your questions that have been submitted throughout the presentations this evening. Um, I should mention just now that all the slides from the PowerPoints that we've just seen are now available to download from the webinar page. There's been a few people asking about how to access those, so those are all available to everybody now. Like I say, we're just gonna go through some of the questions just now and um, that have been submitted throughout the webinar. So the first question is for Caitlin and Kirsty with regards to monitoring patients who are on TPN um, and how you categorize your patients as stable or unstable and are there any defining factors in that decision with regards to biochemistry or fluid balance, any other factors you would take into consideration? 
Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks for um, the person who submitted that question. Um, so categorising them as stable and unstable, we would probably look at the whole, like the bigger picture. So back, going back through your A, B, C, D, E. So if they were stable, we would be looking for a, a stable weight or other anthropometric measurements. Um, we would like to see their refeeding bloods within range um, or at least stable and the same with their LFTs and urea and electrolytes to suggest that they were in appropriate fluid balance um, and that their liver function wasn't being so um, significantly affected by the TPN. In terms of clinically stable, I guess you're just looking at their overall clinical picture, um, what their gut function is like, what their blood sugar is like, um, is there any indication for sliding scale, things like that. Um, and I guess what our overall aim of care is for the patient, you know, is it appropriate to keep going with the TPN? Is it going to change their outcome? And then, of course, is TPN still appropriate? So is the gut functioning? Um, has it started to function again? Can we use an alternative method of feeding? So I get it would just be an overall picture. So if, if these variables um, were kind of out with our normal range, we would suggest they were unstable. Um, but obviously, we're aiming for them all to be um, in a more stable range. Hopefully, that answers that question. Perfect. Thank you. Um, there's a question come through as well with in um, regards to weight gain um, using the new nutritional requirements and um, if we're still using the 400 to 1000 calories. Um, in our underweight patients. So I guess from, from my presentation this evening, we're already aiming that kind of upper end of 25 to 30 calories per kilo for our underweight patients for the BMI of less than 18.5. Um, and so certainly we'll be aiming kind of higher end than what we would be for our healthy weight patients already. But certainly if I did have to add on extra calories, if I felt it was needed based on the patient's presentation and what was happening with say their weight etc then I would still use that kind of 400 calories as a starting point where we where we would have previously added 400 calories and um, Rebecca Gash I don't know what your experience is with these patients in the community yeah it's um it's quite similar actually um and I think that's why referenced in my case study there just on that final slide um I've Although the new PENG guidelines, they do focus more on clinical judgment and, you know, watching what their weight's doing and making amendments that way. Um, I still kind of refer to the old guidelines where they did say that kind of starting point of adding in an extra 400 calories a day. So I've used that as a bit of a guide um, for my patient case study there. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we've got another question for you, Rebecca Gash, about how we feed our Crohn's patients during flare-ups and infections. Yeah, so with um, patients with Crohn's disease, actually the ESPEN guidelines are really useful um, references for this. So they re released some guidelines just last year, um, clinical nutrition in inflammatory bowel disease. And that kind of talks through obviously the evidence base behind what we choose to do in terms of Crohn's disease when it's in a flare up. So for myself, it's obviously guided a lot by the MDT decision um, and, you know, discussions with the consultant gastroenterologists. But um, so it's very patient specific, but it can range from using oral nutritional supplements um, just to supplement an oral diet to make sure that they're meeting their nutritional needs um, or it can progress into a full liquid diet. Now a, a liquid diet so purely enterally fed um, for a period of time is known to be um, evidence for paediatrics or adolescents and um, there's less evidence for the use of it in adult Crohn's patients but we do still tend to use this um, in our practice anyway. If that's not tolerated orally you could look to do enteral feeding so a, often an NG feed for a, a short period of time um, if you're looking to promote that bowel rest um, and then parenteral nutrition is an option but only if there's um, a reason why you can't be feeding um, enterally into the gut. So that's kind of the, the three options that we would usually use in a Crohn's flare-up. But as I said, it is quite an MDT uh, decision. But yeah, ESPEN guidelines are good to refer to. Thank you. 
Um, we've got another question here for Caitlin and Kirsty. Um, with regards to your patient who was on the clear fluids for four days, and um, was that a decision that was made by the surgeons? And a couple of questions as well about the access you have to NG feeding and how easy it is to access that for the patients. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so with regards to the clear fluids, that was um, something that was a decision that was made by the surgeons on admission that the patient would be on clear fluids for four days, um, purely because they, they come in with abdominal pain and associated vomiting. So it was best to just give the, the, the patient, patient some gut rest, um, which is why they decided to proceed with the clear fluids. With regards to the, the NJ feeding, I'm not sure whether that question came before um, and had moved on to um, talk about the fact that we, we did want to nasal jejunally feed the patient. So that very much is an MDT approach um, that, that we took um, to feed. And obviously we realised that entrally the patient wasn't going to tolerate um, nasogastric feeding. We then um, proceeded with nasal jejunal feeding. So yeah, very much an MDT approach we took. Thank you. And Rebecca Gash, there's been a, a couple of questions about medications trialled for gastroparesis. I don't know what your experience is with that, with this patient or, or any of the other patients in your case. Um, thinking back, I can't remember exactly what, <laughs> what was trialled um, for that particular case study, but currently um, that patient is using a combination of Domperidone and Ondansetron, so having a few days on the Domperidone and then going on Ondansetron, and that seems to be working um, best for, for them at the moment. Thank you. And um, there's been a, a lot of questions coming in, and it's probably relevant to all of us um, in our presentations about protein and um, nitrogen values used. Um, certainly Kirsty and Caitlin, there's a question then about why the use of the 1.5 grams per kilogram when you um, calculated the requirements for your patient using the new requirements. Um, thanks, Rebecca. So um, for that one, we when we calculated it with the new requirements, that was obviously done retrospectively um, because this patient is from before we rolled out the, the new um Pench requirements. Um, the equation, the reason we use the 1.5 grams per kilo, um, we did it on his ideal body weight because that's um, comes into the category of surgical patients at risk in the new guidelines, which we felt he was. Um, he had a lot of um, he had a, a lot of things going on in his overall clinical presentation. So we did feel he was a surgical patient at risk. So that's why we used the 1.5 grams per kilo of ideal body weight. However, as you've detailed. Um, quite a lot in your talk, um, Rebecca, that it all comes down to clin clinical judgment. So this was very much a, a retrospective look at new requirements. Um, but if you were faced with a similar patient um, in clinical practice, it would come down to your clinical judgment and the patient's overall condition. Perfect, thank you. And um, Rebecca Gash, I don't know again with your patients in community how you found the the new protein requirements i think i've certainly found that they, they do tend to be higher than what we would have calculated before across the range um, and sometimes more difficult to meet from that point of view yeah and um and, you know, I think we keep repeating the same thing here, really, don't we, by saying, um, you know, clinical judgment always. And, um, you know, I think it's quite with the new PENG requirements, I do think it's quite good in a way that they do give quite a big range in some ways, because it gives you more kind of um, leeway to be able to justify um, your, your decisions and, um, yeah, yeah, a bit more kind of a freedom with it while still practicing safely. There's a, a question come in about um, patients who are obese, and in this case, it's about um, a, a liver patient, a whole liver disease patient, um, asking whether um, mifflin would be appropriate to use, or if calories per kilo would be a better option. Obviously, these are patients that are of high nutritional risk. Um, and I think what I would do with these patients, although you know, liver isn't my 
specialist area with these kind of patients that we know are very high nutritional risk and are obese, I would tend to do mifflin and perhaps the calories per kilo option as well. And then see, again, clinical judgment where I think within the range, maybe between those, what seems to fit best with that patient. I don't know if you have much experience with these patients in the obese category. Um, yeah, so, well, again, I'd agree with you there, Rebecca, because I think this happens quite a, quite a lot with different patient categories. With the new guidelines, it actually gives, it can give a few different options for you. So when this tends to happen, I do tend to work out both requirements and maybe look at how big that range is and um, start off with one in between the ranges and then, you know, reviewing and um, changing it as needed. I don't know if the others have any um, input. Uh, no, I, I was say the exact same, Rebecca. We tend to we would work out both and then kind of find a, a starting point, probably in the, the middle of the range, and, and work from there based on um, clinical judgment. Again, it's it, is, it all just comes down to clinical judgment. Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah, yeah. I think there's certain groups of patients that we just know clinically are so vulnerable. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, we just need to, to think about these a bit more. Absolutely. Um, there's a question again coming for Caitlin and Kirsty with regards to why um, you didn't try NG feeding prior to the TPN or what the thought process was there in deciding a route for nutrition. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I think um, Kirsty kind of touched on that as well um, when she answered the previous question about the NG feeding, but um, NG feeding we try to do as an as much of an MDT decision as possible um, in our hospital. Um, the other thing being that it can take a couple of days to arrange um, an NG tube at times. Um, and at this point, the patient was started on TPN. Um, he was in intensive care. So we don't often have patients on NG feeds in intensive care. Um, we just, it's just, I believe, historical. We, we tend to use more of TPN and then we can go down the NG route when we get um, the amount of intensive care. It's just quite impractical to um, arrange these things. So as I say, it was it was purely because it, there would have been a delay in getting him, um, get him in, giving him nasogeginal feed just because of the time it would take to get it arranged. Yeah, we can resonate with that. Certainly, I think in a lot of a lot of hospitals, it is a, it's a time factor sometimes when we've got these these vulnerable patients. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And there's a question come in um, for Rebecca Gash again about um, gastroparesis and if you would ever advise patients to stop oral intake because of vomiting in gastroparesis. Uh, yes, so um, it, yeah, using the case study today, um, this patient uh, is not taking any any oral intake. Um, even if they found that they were drinking too much fluid, then that that can cause vomiting. So this particular case is is quite a a severe case of gastroparesis. Obviously, different patients uh, differ. Some people can tolerate more of a um a, an oral diet or more of a liquid diet. Um. But yeah, for, for the particular case study I discussed today, um, uh, no, nothing um, orally. So she's having flushes um, through the tube, obviously, to keep her, her hydrated as well. Perfect. So just uh, a couple of more questions, just the last few questions before we wrap up for this evening. Um, Caitlin and Kirsty, in terms of your case study today, um, you talked about using a peptide-based feed to avoid prion with your patient. And I just wondered in terms of oral nutritional supplements that you would normally give these patients, would it be a case of a standard supplement with prion to cover that if required? Or would you ever use a peptide-based supplement to, again, try avoid the, the use of prion? Um, so no, we would just use a standard um, as per our formulary here in um, NHS KK, we would just use a standard feed tolerated alongside prion um, and just adjust the uh, prion dosage as um, the patient um, tolerates um, as such. Um, we do have um, vital 1.5, oh, sorry, we, we do have alternative peptic based 
um, supplements um, in taste aids that we don't tend to to use them as standards. Just purely taste factor, we don't. Um, they're not as well tolerated as what um, the the standards uh, standards and traditional supplements are. So yeah, we do use crayon alongside with. Them. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And um, just the final question, there's a question come in about how we calculate dry body weight in our patients. And I think um, for me personally, it's, it's a really tough one. I think I would rarely have a true dry body weight for my patients. I'd have an estimate based on what I guesstimate their edema or ascites to be, like how fluid overloaded they are. Um, we certainly in our department don't really have um, the equipment available to us to have a really accurate um, dry body weight. I don't know if any of you have any different answers to that or, or any points to discuss around that. Um, I, would, I would say the same. It's, it's difficult sometimes to get an accurate dry weight. Um, we often, um, I'm sure most, like most um, health boards, we can look back at previous GP records to have a uh, like a, a, re a weight before admission, so before they were acutely ill, and to see if that would give us an indication. Um, obviously, if you if they've come in with more weight loss, then consider that when you're estimating their dry weight. But I agree, um, Rebecca, it can be really tricky to to work that one out. And again, it comes down to good old clinical judgment. I think. I think that is the yeah the overall message from this webinar is our use of clinical judgment. Um, as teams and individually as clinicians and making sure that we, we really think about our decisions that we're making and, and our experience and how that drives our clinical judgment. Okay, I'm afraid that's all we have time for this evening. So thank you everybody for joining us for this webinar this evening. Like I've already said, the slides are available to download and thank you again to our panelists for presentations and questions. <laughs>